Hello. Today I will read uh, the first chapter of a book called Language, Its Nature, Development and Origin by linguist Otto Jespersen um, and it was originally published in 1922. So, first chapter um, before 1800s, paragraph 1, Antiquity. The science of language began tentatively and approximately when the minds of men first turned to problems like these. How is that people do not speak everywhere the same language? How words first created? What is the relation between a name and the thing it stands for? Why is such and such a person or such and such a thing called this and not that? The first answers of uh, these questions, like primitive answers to other riddles of the universe, were largely theological. God, or one particular God, had created um, language, or God led all animals to the first man in order that he might give them names. Thus, in the Old Testament, the diversity of languages is explained as a punishment from God for man's crimes and um, presumption. There were great and general problems, but the minds of the early Jews were also occupied by smaller and more particular problems of language, as when etymological interpretation were given of such personal name as when that's um, immediately self-explanatory. The same predilection for etymology and a similar primi primitive kind of etymology based entirely on a more or less accidental similarity of sound and easily satisfied with any fanciful connection in sense is found abundantly in Greek writers and in their Latin imitators. But to the speculative minds of Greek thinkers, the problem that proved most attractive was the general and abstract one. Are words natural and necessary expressions of the notion underlying them, or are they merely uh, arbitrary and conventional signs for notions that might have been equally well expressed by any other sounds? Endless discussions were carried on about these questions, as we see particularly from Plato's Catullus, and no very definite result was arrived at, nor could any be expected so long as one language only formed the basis of the discussion, even in our own days, after a century of comparative philology, the question still remains an open one. In Greece, the two catchwords, fusé by nature and tizi by convention, for centuries divided philosophers and grammarians into two camps, while some, like Socrates in Plato's dialogue, Though admitting that in language as actually existing there was no natural connection between words and things, still wished that an ideal language might be created in which words and things would be tied together in a perfectly rational way, thus paving the way for Bishop Wilkins and other modern constructors of philosophical languages. Such abstract and a priori speculation, however stimulating and clever, hardly deserve the name of science as this term is understood nowadays. Science presupposes careful observation and systematic classification of fact and of that in the old Greek writers and language refine very little. The earliest matters in linguistic observation and classification were the old Indian grammarians. The language of the old sacred hymns had become in many points obsolete, but religion required that not one iota of these revered texts should be altered, and a scrupulous oral tradition kept them unchanged from generation to generation in every minute particular. This led to a wonderful exact analysis of speech sounds in which every detail of articulation was carefully described, and to a no less admirable analysis of grammatical forms which were arranged systematically and described in a concise and highly ingenious though artificial terminology. The whole manner of treatment was entirely different from the methods of Western grammarians, and when the works of Panini and other Sanskrit grammarians were first made known to Europeans in the 19th century, they profoundly influenced our own linguistic science as witnessed, among other things, by the fact that some of the Indian technical terms are still extensively used, for instance, those describing various kinds of compounds nouns. In Europe, um, grammatical science was slowly and laboriously developed in Greece and later in Rome. Aristotle led the uh, foundation of the division of words into parts of speech and introduced the notion of case, 
apoptosis, his work in this connection was continued by Stoics made up whose grammatical distinctions and terms are still in use, the latter in their Latin dress, which embodies some curious mistakes, as when genike, the case of kind or species, was rendered genitivus as if it meant the case of origin, or worse still, when aitatike, the case of object, was rendered accusativus as if um, from aitai, aitaiomai, um, I accuse. In later times, uh, the philological school of Alexandria was particularly important, the object of research being the interpretation of the old poets whose language was no longer instantly intelligible. Details of flexion and of the meaning of words were described and referred to the two categories of analogy or regularity and an anomaly or irregularity, but real insights into the nature of language made very little progress either with the Alexandrians or with the Romans inheritors, and etymology still remains in the childlike stage. 2. Middle Age and Renaissance Nor did linguistic science advance in the Middle Ages. The chief thing um, then was learning Latin as the common language of the church and of what little there was of civilization generally, but Latin was not studied in a scientific spirit and the various vernacular languages which one by one blossomed out into languages of literature even less so. The Renaissance in so far brought about a change in this as it widened the horizon, especially by introducing the study of Greek. It also favoured grammatical studies through the stress it... Um, by uh, the stress it laid on correct Latin as represented in the best period of classic literature. It now became the ambition of humanists in all countries to write Latin like Cicero. In the following centuries, we witness a constantly deepening interest in the various living languages of Europe, owing to the growing importance of native literatures and to increased facilities of international traffic and communication in general. The most important factor here was, of course, the invention of printing, which rendered it incomparably more easy than formerly to obtain the means of studying foreign languages. It should be noted also that in those times, the prevalent theological interest made it a much more common thing than nowadays for ordinary scholars to have some knowledge of Hebrew as the original language of the Old Testament. The acquaintance with a language so different in type from those spoken in Europe, in many ways, stimulated the interest in linguistic studies, though, on the other hand, it proved a fruitful source of error, because the position of the Semitic family of languages was not yet understood, and because Hebrew was thought to be the language spoken in paradise, and therefore imagined to be the language from which all other languages were descended. All kinds of fanciful similarities between Hebrew and European languages were taken as proofs of the origin of the latter. Every imaginable permutation of sounds, or rather, of letters, was looked upon as possible so long as there was a slight connection in the sense of the two words compared, and however incredible it may seem nowadays, the fact that Hebrew was written from right to left, while we, in our writing, proceed from left to right, was considered justification enough for the most violent transposition of letters in etymological explanations. And yet all these flighty and whimsical comparisons served, perhaps in some measures, to pave the way for a more systematic treatment of etymology through co collecting vast stores of words from which sober and critical minds might select those instances of indubitable connection on which a sound science of etymology could eventually be constructed. The discovery and publication of text in the old Gothic Germanic languages, especially Wolfiller's Gothic translation of the Bible, compared with which Old English, Anglo-Saxon, Old German and Old Icelandic texts were of less thought by no, though by no means of despicable account, paved the way for historical treatment of this important group of language in the 17th and 18th centuries. But on the whole, the interest in the history of languages in those days was small, and linguistic thinkers thought it more urgent to establish vast treasuries of language, languages as actually spoken than to follow the development of any one language from century to century. Thus, we see that the great philosopher Leibniz, who took much interest in linguistic pursuits, and to whom we owe many judicious utterances on the possibility of a universal language, instigated Peter the Great to have vocabularies and specimens collected of all the various languages of all uh, of his vast empire. To this initiative taken by Leibniz, and to the great personal interest that 
the Empress Catherine the second took in these studies we owe directly or indirectly um, the great repertories of all languages then known first palace lingua um totuso vocabulario comparativa uh, 1786-87 then however's catalogo de las lenguas de las naciones conocidas 1800s and finally other links um, mit mitrader order sorry <laughs> I don't speak German. Mithridates oder Allgemeine Sprachenkunde, 1806-1817. In spite of their inevitable shortcomings, their uncritical and unequal treatment of many languages, the preponderance of lexical over grammatical information, and the use of biblical texts as their sole connected illustration, these great works exercised a mighty influence on the linguistic thought and research of the time and contributed very much to the birth of the linguistic science of the 19th century. It should not be forgotten, moreover, that Herbert was one of the first to recognize the superior importance of grammar to vocabulary for deciding questions of relationship between languages. It will be well here to consider the manner in which languages and the teaching of languages were generally viewed during the centuries preceding the rise of comparative linguistics. The chief language taught was Latin. The first, and in many cases, the only grammar with which scholars came into contact was Latin grammar. No wonder, therefore, that grammar and Latin grammar came in the minds of most people to be synonyms. Latin grammar played an enormous role in the schools to the exclusion of many subjects which we are now beginning to think more essential for the education of the young. Um, the traditional term for secondary school was in England grammar school and in Denmark Latin scholar. And the reason for both expressions was obviously the same. Here, however, we are concerned with the uh, with this privileged position of Latin grammar only in so far as it's influenced the treatment of languages in general. It did so in more ways than one. Latin was a language with a wealth of flexional forms and in describing other languages the same categories as were as were found in latin were applied as a matter of course um even where there was nothing in these other languages which really corresponded to what was found in latin in english and danish grammar's paradigm of nouns declension were given with such cases as accusative dative and ablative in spite of the fact that there is no separate forms for these cases had existed for centuries all languages were indiscriminately settled with the elaborate Latin system of tenses and moves in the verbs, and by means of such Procrustean methods, the actual facts of many languages were distorted and mis misrepresented. Discriminations which had no foundation in reality were never nevertheless insisted on, while discrimination which happened to be non-existent in Latin were apt to be overlooked. The mischief consequent on these unfortunate methods of measuring all grammar after the pattern of Latin grammar has not even yet completed, completely disappeared, and it is even now difficult to find a single grammar of any language that is not here and there influenced by the Latin bias. Latin was chiefly taught as a written language. Witness the totally different manner in which Latin was pronounced in the different countries, the consequence being that, as early as the 16th century, French and English scholars were unable to understand each other's spoken Latin. This led to the almost exclusive occupation which, with letter instead of sounds, the fact that all language is primarily spoken and only secondly written down, that the real life of language is in the mouth and ear and not in the pen and eye, was overlooked to the detriment of a real understanding of the essence of language and linguistic developments and very often where the spoken form of a language was accessible scholars contented contented themselves with a reading knowledge in spite of many efforts some of which go back to the 16th century but which did not become really powerful to the rise of modern phonetics in the 19th century. The fundamental significance of spoken as opposed to written language has not yet been fully appreciated by all linguists. There are still too many writers on philological questions who have evidently never tried to think in sounds instead of thinking in letters and symbols and who would probably be sorely puzzled if they were to pronounce all the forms that come so ghibli to their pen. What Sweet wrote in 1877 in the preface to his Handbook of Phonetics is perhaps less true now than it was then, but it still contains some elements of truth. Many instances, he said, might be quoted of the way in which important philological facts and laws have been passed over or misrepresented through the observer's way of phonetic trainings. <laughs>
slightest failings to observe the Lithuanian accent or even to comprehend them when pointed out by Kirchad is a striking instance. But there can be no doubt that uh, the way in which Latin has been for centuries made the basis of all linguistic instruction is largely responsible for the preponderance of eye philology to ear philology in the history of our science. We next come to a point which, to my mind, is very important because it concerns something which has had and had justly had enduring effects on the manner in which language and especially grammar is viewed and taught to this day. What was the object of teaching Latin in the Middle Ages and later? certainly not the purely scientific one of imparting knowledge for knowledge's own sake, apart from any practical use or advantage, simply in order to widen the spiritual horizon and to obtain the joy of pure intellectual understanding. For such, purpose, for such a purpose, some people with scientific leaning for such a purpose, some people with scientific leanings may here and there take up the study of some out of the way African or American idiom, but the reasons for teaching and learning Latin were so idealistic. Latin was not even taught and learned solely for the, with the purpose of opening the doors to the old classical or to the more recent religious literature in that language, but um, chiefly and in the first instance because Latin was a practical and highly important means of communication between educated people. One had to learn not only to read Latin, but also to write Latin, if one wanted to maintain no matter how humble a position in the Republic of Learning, or in the hierarchy of the Church. Consequently, grammar was not even primarily the science of how words were inflected and how forms were used by the old Romans, but chiefly and essentially the art of inflecting words and of using the forms yourself if you wanted to write correct Latin. And I will stop here, because... I just want to stop now. Good night.